Hello everyone, welcome to Chasing a Murderer. And I have missed you guys so much. And I'm trying to get back here a little bit more regular. So, you know, we've been following this doomsday couple for four years. And we're telling their story, but it's taking a long time. And that story is, we're talking about Lori Vallow slash Daybell and her lover, husband, Chad Daybell. Man, Lori can probably make a photo album of all the mug shots that she has. This couple is considered to be one of the most evil couples here on Earth. And you know that Chad Daybell's trial is coming up April 1st. And that Lori's already been trialed for three of the five victims that she's been accused uh, to conspire to kill and two of them being her own children, JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan. So here we are. We are on part 136 of Life Beyond the Grave, where we're covering a lot of the background timeline of how this couple led up to where they are today, how her two children ended up in the backyard of her lover's home in Rexburg, Idaho. Who took Charles Vallow's life and who attempted to take Brandon Boudreaux's? Well, we're in the summer of 2019 right now. We're approaching the end of July and there's some little hints of information that kind of gives you an idea of where their mindset is and just how evil these bunch of people are. Lori Vallow is obsessed with a book called Visions of Glory. She's obsessed with building this new Jerusalem along with a temple, a city, and all of this is preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. Chad Daybell has taught and believes that the property surrounding his home in Salem, Idaho, is playing a very significant role in the preparing of Jesus Christ's return. It's no surprise that Chad Daybell has been talking about these properties surrounding his home for years and that he's become quite open about it, especially at the Preparing the People conferences. Now that Charles Vello has passed away, there's nothing really stopping Lori from taking those steps forward that they believe they need to make. But Chad Daybell, he seems stuck. He still has his wife living, and this is a problem. As long as his wife, Tammy Daybell's alive, it's going to be an interference for his progress, for his future with his lover, Lori Vallow. JJ has to continue going to school. And when he does, Lori Vallow tells the school several weeks after Charles was shot, that he had taken his own life. Eventually, school staff will actually do an online search and discover that Lori Vallow was lying. And I want to mention this just in case. It's about not even two months when she withdraws JJ from the school and tells the school that she's moving to California. She's taking a new job offer. Remember, she had told the school that J.J. didn't know that his father had passed away. This could be one of the many reasons why Lori Vallow wouldn't allow J.J. to attend his own father's memorial. Before we go too much further, I want to share something that is attached to this group um, who believe that the end days are approaching. Now, one of the things and one of the resources that they're using to prove that this might be true is coming from what is called the Isaiah Institute. For those of you following this case closely, trying to figure out everything, this video gives you a few little clues about their mindset. But due to copyright reasons, I will not be showing the video. Their apocalyptic studies combine current events with fantasy events, sending fear throughout anyone who is interested in their teachings. They were started by the Hebrews 
Foundation in 2000. And this is something that Melanie Gibb especially was interested in. Melanie Gibb seemed to have a connection to all the end day groups that she said she wasn't actually focused on. All of them had something in common, and that was building cities for the end days that were approaching in our time. There was no doubt in her mind that the end days were here. Focused on building, you know, communities that work together for a common belief system. And that is that end days are nearly upon us. And this group developed new teachings along the way. These castings that many of these people were involved in, including Melanie Gibb, Melanie Boudreaux, Serena, Christina, Zolima, and Nicole, they knew that she was adamant about getting rid of this dark entity in Charles at any cost. They know that Charles is now deceased, and they claim that they had no ill intentions towards Charles. But they continue to support Lori, though they see these very strange things happening very questionable, and things that should actually throw up tons of red flags. Now, many people believe that Melanie Boudreaux knew exactly what she was doing, but there's some hint and chance that perhaps Melanie Boudreaux was being drastically manipulated by her aunt, Lori. Melanie Gibb would admit later that she believed that Lori sunk her claws into Melanie Boudreaux, convinced her that her husband Brandon was a demon, a zombie. She also convinces her to take a look at the nice life insurance on her husband Brandon. Not only that, Melanie Gibbs said that she believed later that Lori was responsible for the problems this couple was going through, 100% destroyed their lives, their family's lives, and convince them to even get a divorce. Anyone in Lori's life, their life becomes a hectic whirlwind. And who do they spend most of their time talking to? It's not so much Chad Daybell as it is Lori Vallow. And Lori Vallow seems to have her nose in everyone's private life. She knows who has how much insurance, and on who. Melanie Boudreaux is getting closer to her aunt, but also I noticed that Lori Vallow is starting to control her niece. She's not allowing her niece to get too far after Charles Vallow was shot. If Melanie wants to go take off for the weekend, she can't do it. It's almost as if Melanie Boudreaux is a prisoner. We learned at the end of this month, is when Lori Vallow is said to be searching Craigslist, trying to sell the dog. Ultimately, the trainer ends up getting up with her and making plans to pick the dog up. And all the money and time that Charles had put into this training dog for his son, JJ, seemed to be for nothing. Why would Lori want to get rid of this dog? She knows how important this dog is for her son. And here she is, July 26, searching cell service dog. A few people who have covered this story believe that she tried to actually get $2,000 out of the service dog. And when the original trainer caught wind of this, they reached out to Lori. Also this day, Chad texts Lori with something quite interesting. I'm going to play that for you. I do. And can you indicate who had sent that message? Uh, this is a message found on uh, Lori's device, the lolly time from Chad to Lori, dated 7-26-2019 at 8.13 p.m. And could you read it into the record? Tonight I figured out who I feel like. <clears throat> I'm a grown-up version of Harry Potter who has to live with the Dudleys in his little space under the stairs. Every few weeks, I get to escape and have an amazing adventure and have amazing adventures with my goddess. 
lover, but then I have to return to my place under the stairs, feeling trapped, but I sense permanent freedom is coming. And read the text into the record. Yes, so on 7.30 or July 30th, 2019, Chad sent Lori an SMS message that read, I got the inspiration to go back to my original death percentages that helped us track Charles, Ned, etc. Tammy is very close. Her percentage has fallen steadily since Hiblos left. It is encouraging. To indicate who sent those to whom they were sent, the date, and read the content into the record. Uh, on September 3rd, 2019 at 10.02 a.m., Alex sent Lori a message. Network name is anti layman Password is the number two. Too many kids. Lori responded to Alex. Funny. Lori and Salima had used their spiritual powers to actually hover over Charles Bellow's truck. This is something that they believe is effective. So it seems like they all like to speak in this code. A code that insinuates that they're hurting people, but carefully worded. Right before August, Lori plans a trip to California with JJ, her niece, Melanie Boudreau, as well as Melanie Boudreau's children. Lori receives a text from Chad Daybell. Do you want me to cause pain yet to those two threes you're writing with? Lori's response is to hold off initially. Her text says they will be a mistake to deal with, but I'll text you if they start acting up and we can zap them. Sounds great. Chad texts back, yes, if they are going to act up, we'll at least give them a reason to scream. I love and cherish and adore you. The wonderful memories keep coming back. You are mesmerizing. Raphael is one lucky guy. During this time, according to Detective Hart, death percentages are discussed frequently. It's that ranking system of whether or not they are at 1% or 100%. The lower you get on the ranking scale, the closer you are to death. That's what they believe. But this got kind of confusing because the death percentages kind of flip-flop. Sometimes their percentage, once it hit 100, meant that you were close to death. Sometimes zero meant it was death. There's no doubt that Lori is growing very impatient and around July 28th of 2019, Lori says, are you mad, sad, what? Chad says, I'm doing okay, just no privacy here to hardly text. And I'm missing you immensely. I feel good about the trip. Lori to Chad, I need a distraction while I'm waiting for you. I love you. Chad to Lori, absolutely. I think you'll have a fun time. So, you know, Lori's very, very impatient waiting for them two to be together, as I've said multiple times. It's also around this time that you notice JJ's ranking drops down to two and Tammy, his wife, to three. Chad insists that his wife Tammy is getting very close. Her percentage has fallen steadily since hip blows left, since Charles has been dead. They are threatening to punish and abuse children through the spiritual um, powers that they have, inflicting pain, saying that people are close to death. In one text, Lori responds to Chad with, what is their percentage now? What about JJ's two? Chad tells Lori, Tammy is at three, JJ is at two. Both are being heavily shielded to stop intruders. We've kind of gone over this one once already, but I wasn't certain exactly where it went. And I believe it's going to go more towards the end of July going into August. Because Lori says to Chad, she's disappointed 2 and 3%, not 0. And Chad tells her, I will explain when we talk. In order to manipulate Chad a little more, she tells Chad that she's feeling hot for him. Lori will drop um, JJ off at school, saying how she puts a shield of protection around him. 
At the same time, they're talking about inflicting pain. Nothing these guys do makes sense. Oftentimes, they're referring to many people in their lives that they feel are in their way as obstacles. We know that Tylee Ryan knew um, that she was dealing with something that was quite scary with her mother. And you know that Lori is more careful of what she said about Tylee be simply because Tylee was always around. Lori said that her own daughter, her spirit had been gone and had been taken over by a demon called Viola. I can't imagine what Tylee's going through. She knows that her stepfather has been shot. Her mother is calling everyone zombies. And Charles was a zombie and now he's gone. Does Tylee know that she and JJ are zombies? Did she have anybody to relate to or talk to? But Lori has a lot of negative and bad things to say about her own daughter, Tylee. Serena is a witness when she speaks to uh, um, investigators later on, and I'll share that. Um, you said Lori mentioned her daughter, Tylee, was uh, either dark or a zombie. Is that the only time you've ever heard Lori mention that about Tylee? Or was there other times? What did she bring up with that? Or what do you recall her saying about Tylee? Yeah. Uh, we also had conversations with Lori some of them were over the phone and then like but we didn't talk often either. Only a few times. Um it, only a few times. Um it was just that and then that weekend. Her daughter's dark and part of that's because of the abuse she suffered. Um but that it was hard because she was a constant and she didn't use this word, I'm trying to interpret with my own words, but like a flag or disruptor maybe to like Lori's mission. So she talked about that, like how like Tylee was trying to distract her. Um, it was just hard living with somebody who was so dark. And, okay. Yeah. When, and this, one, this might be hard to remember, but when was the first time she brought that up about Tylee? Was it before March 2019? No, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't think she mentioned anything like that because we had that that first weekend for preparing the people when I was here. Mm -hmm. That didn't come up at all. Like, that wasn't part of it. Uh, so I'm trying to remember, like, was it sometime between then or March when I was here? It must have been some, I'm guessing it was sometime between then. Between. Over the phone. Okay. Before. You came in March. Before I came in March. Okay. So Serena tells you, you know, Lori's mindset that her daughter was a distraction to her. So maybe her daughter is trying to talk her out of doing these things or uh, trying to talk sense into her. Maybe she didn't believe in any of it. And that's why she was a distraction. We don't know. Serena says that she didn't hear Lori mention that JJ was a zombie. And Serena is kicked out of this group around this time, and she'll talk to him a couple of times, and we'll go over that as we get into the fall. Melanie Gibbs said that she talks to Melanie Boudreaux, you know, several times about her personal strive she's got going on in her life. Worried about her family, and so we had conversations about what was going on to some level. I mean, I, I wasn't as involved with their conversations as Lurie and as far as I went, we, we just were a support of, you know, to each other, I think. Would it be fair to say that you, Chad, Lori, Melanie, Alex, Zulema, you six were kind of a, a close group of friends, kind yeah. of a tight knit family in yes. a way. Yes. So you all would spend a lot of time together and, and during these, these uh, meetups, you know, over dinner or whatever, you talk about religious things, the mysteries of God, things like that. Sometimes we didn't meet together as a group, very, you know, like a close friendship group together very often. We met um, 
on a very rare occasion together, all of us. We more like saw each other here and there, or talked on the phone or took a drive here together. But that kind of, you know, like you would a friend, you know, yeah. always, always get together as a group. But yeah. And was it always religious talk? Pretty much. I would say so. Not, not a lot of other talk about politics or the uh, no, weather. Politics. Probably not politics and sports. No, I wouldn't even talk about that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> gardening, whatever. I'm going to talk about gardening. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was mainly religious talk when you'd all get together. Yeah. It's around this time that Lori will start visiting the temple because she's having thoughts about moving to Rexburg. But Tammy is still here on this earth. So how would that work out? Melanie Gibbs said she will witness that, yes, indeed, Lori was thinking about moving to Rexburg, but she wasn't sure if she really wanted to do it or not. And we'll cover that starting on the next episode. Thank you so much, guys, for your love and support. I appreciate it so much. And to my Patreons, to just my viewers overall. Love you guys, and I'll see you guys soon.